C'est un grand plaisir d'être ici et je voulais bien remercier le comité de, euh, de l'organisation, et particulièrement euh, Alexandre et Andreas pour l'invitation et pour la possibilité de vous expliquer certains euh, principes de symétrie et d'asymétrie dans le système des vivants. Et euh, malgré le fait euh, que j'ai la même nationalité et même des éléments de normes communs avec le dernier euh, speaker hier, euh, mon français n'est pas assez évalué et euh, j'aimerais bien de changer en anglais pour cette présentation. So, if you don't mind, I will continue speaking in English. And uh, I would like to start with the first slide, going back to a, a presentation which you have in the program, and which is actually uh, from Leonardo da Vinci, a presentation of the Vitruvian Man. Uh, this Vitruvian Man and Leonardo da Vinci are very uh, telling for the theme of this uh, conference, which is about symmetries and asymmetries, because there are various aspects of symmetry and asymmetry in the character of Leonardo da Vinci and in this presentation. As you can see, first of all, there is a clear symmetrical uh, arrangement of the body of this Vitruvian man with the left side and the right side, but there's an asymmetry with the uh, top and the bottom of the body. So in fact, there are actually three body axes and I will go later on in my talk into the basics of the generation of such body axes. But what is interesting with uh, Da Vinci as well is that uh, he had a personality that he himself wrote actually all of his notes. This is the original, you can't see it in the program, but here you see that he wrote his notes in mirror image actually. And uh, with respect to yesterday's presentation, Uh, I don't actually know whether he wrote with the left hand or with the right hand and whether this was uh, just uh, uh, an aspect of security of his notes or whether it was just uh, that he had so much uh, intellectual power that he could not write normally but for him it was more a challenge of writing actually in mirror image. So that is already an aspect of symmetry here and then if you translate what is written here, so my son Uh, did this for me, uh, it's actually, Leonardo speaks about an architect who gives uh, ideal body measures of a man. And this is that uh, four fingers generate a palm, uh, and uh, four palms have the size of a foot, six palms have the size of an elbow, and four elbows make the size of a man. And what is interesting there is that these are all even numbers, so there's a symmetry in these numbers. And it's tempting to speculate that there may be a link between symmetry, ideal body measures, and actually, or perhaps, beauty. And in fact, when I prepared this talk, I uh, looked in the literature and found in 1994 two papers in Nature, one of the most prestigious journals in our field, in which they had uh, thought about experiments which were known for quite some time, which showed that the more symmetrical a face is made, and you can do that by computational measures, the people who are looking at these faces, the test persons, consider the most symmetrical ones as the most attractive ones. So if they are asked to choose a preferred one, they prefer actually the most symmetrical one, irrespectively of uh, gender, age, or of ethnics. And in these two papers, the, the, the authors actually asking what could be the origin or the link between beauty and uh, attractiveness and perhaps evolution. Evolution because it has, has been known that in some species actually females prefer to mate with males which have symmetrical Uh, sexual ornaments and the question is uh, is this actually a readout about male quality so the more symmetric a male is is it uh, because this male is more uh, apt to resist and to survive in nature 
And the bottom line of these two papers is actually uh, a bit uh, uh, depressing or, or rewarding in the sense that it is not, there is no link between symmetry and beauty itself, but it is actually the laziness of our brain uh, that we consider something which is symmetric preferred because you can simply duplicate the information if you have a symmetrical uh, face or a symmetrical object you can duplicate it and this is a much easier operation for the brain than to register two different halves of the brain so it's a byproduct uh, of cognition that actually symmetric elements or symmetric males are actually preferred over uh, over non-symmetrical elements and males. But, in fact, uh, I was attracted by this, but this is not the topic of my presentation. Uh, the topic of my presentation is rather uh, about asymmetrical or symmetrical events in the generation, organization, and propagation, and the functionality of living systems. And for that, for those who are not specialists, I, apo I apologize to all of those to whom I tell something they know very well. I want to give two examples, two basic examples which are the principles of life which, without which life would not be existing. The first is cell multiplication and diversification. And what I want to point out is that in both of these examples there are symmetrical elements which are essential but as well asymmetrical elements. So the symmetrical elements in the duplication of a structure is simply mitosis. So there you have a cell which goes through a complicated series of events to at the end generate two different cells. This process is essential for the conservation of species, for the duplication of cells, for the generating generation of multicellular <coughs> organisms and of course uh, particularly for the self uh, renewal of stem cells which are also at the basis of the body. Uh, to give you a, a quick example, uh, if this works, yes. So it's just to illustrate how uh, cell division works. You see, oh, oh, this I should not do, otherwise it doesn't continue. What you see in the bottom cell is uh, a cell which is dividing you see that the spindle poles are tearing the chromosomes apart. There's one chromosome in particular which resists, but at the end it will be uh, drawn into the polar plane. And then the chromosomes which have been duplicated will be separated. And there you see cytokinesis is initiating, and at the end two different cells are generated. These two different cells are in principle identical. Of course, they are placed in different environments and due to the interaction with the environment, they will not be identical in shape, uh, but they will be in principle in genetic information uh, uh, identical. So the same, the, the other part, the dichotomous part of cell division is that uh, upon cell division, uh, cells will go, undergo a series of events to become specialized. I show here an example of uh, the hematopoietic system where initially a stem cell which is uh, renewed at a certain uh, level will undergo a different, uh, a distinct amount of decisive steps and these decisions is one uh, of the topics of my lab where my lab is interested in, I'll come to that later on. Uh, and due to these various decisions which are taken at various levels, uh, the cells will adopt a certain fate and this fate will end up, for example, so that you have an erythrocyte generated from the stem cell or following another fate you will have a T lymphocyte, a B lymphocyte generated. And this, of course, is essential for higher organisms because they have this sharing of tasks, organogenesis, uh, in, in difference to uh, single uh, cell organisms. So there are uh, two aspects, symmetry and asymmetry, in the multiplication of the basic unit of an organism. Now the second example, which uh, is uh, well known to you, is simply the DNA. The DNA is itself symmetrical. 
Uh, it, it is actually uh, an anti-parallel alpha helix, so it's not ideally symmetrical, but it is complementary. But you can generate by a process which is called replication a new strand on each of the two mother strands, so the new strand is in brown here displayed, and at the end when you have duplicated this uh, two strands individually, the new strands which are generated are absolutely identical within a certain limit of errors, of course, to the original strand which is generated. This is essential for, because it stores all of the genetic information of an animal. So everything which an animal needs in order to generate, to survive, to live, to defend, is encoded in the DNA. And of course, the identical replication is uh, essential for the maintenance of species, but it has also the chance for evolution because there are built-in errors in this process. Now, the opposite of this process is uh, not the, the duplication itself, but it is the information which is stored along the DNA. And that is depicted here, it's simply a four-letter code. It is like a book, and this book is per definition not symmetrical, it's asymmetrical because it contains information. If you go along these uh, lines, you will not have uh, any symmetrical elements with the exception of what we heard yesterday that there may be palindromes, but these are functional sub-elements. Uh, in general, the information which is encoded along this DNA and the information uh, in contrast to what uh, we thought some years ago, it is such that everything which is on the DNA is used as an information. So not only protein coding genes, but all of the DNA is transcribed and used in various terms. Uh, the size of this uh, DNA is 3.2 billion base pairs. Uh, this is arranged on uh, 23 chromosomes, uh, and it contains information, as I said, on protein coding, genes, it contains regulatory RNAs, there are more and more RNAs which we know existing now, there are structural RNAs, and uh, altogether this means DNA, which is the basis of any life, is both symmetric and asymmetric. Now when it comes to the use of the information uh, which emanates from DNA, we have to uh, see that this use is directional. So there is no symmetry involved anymore in the information transfer from DNA to uh, RNA to protein or to any other structures. So what is depicted here is the DNA simply, which is then organized in higher structures. I'll come to that. Uh, this by a process called transcription is, gener is um, uh, transcribed into uh, RNA, in this case messenger RNA, which then by translation generates proteins. Uh, and these proteins themselves can now feed back onto the DNA, for example, in the form of transcription factors, in that they regulate DNA, or they can feed back in terms of histones that they actually populate these DNA, bind the DNA in certain regulatory elements, and repeated elements, and these uh, proteins which are then bound to DNA can be even locally modified and they generate what we call the epigenome, so functional information locally specified on certain DNA elements. But as I said, from the DNA we can also generate RNAs, which are regulatory RNAs. These regulatory RNAs can be non-coding RNAs, as we call them, and they may themselves feed back on the DNA, regulate DNA processes. Uh, there are various types of DNA processes. I don't want to go into the details there. Or they can also regulate in the form of microRNAs. You may have heard about the translation of uh, mRNAs into proteins. And they can even, and this is still in development, they can even represent platforms for the assembly of DNA. Or they can target machineries like epigenetic machineries uh, as RNA bound molecules to certain elements in this DNA 
to locate the activity of the epigenetic machinery to certain regions in the RNA because DNA, of course, has complementary information and can, buy, can form triplex uh, structures, so two DNA molecules, one RNA molecule, and this has local specific information. Now, in addition, there are multiple machineries in, uh, in eukaryotic cells which can be assembled together with RNAs like the ribosome, channels, mediators, and so forth. <coughs> so the linear DNA is itself not uh, existing in a linear form uh, in the nucleus, but it is highly compacted. It is compacted, this is the DNA structure, it's compacted into nucleosomes. These nucleosomes are uh, compacted into chromatin fibers and this compaction goes on and on until you have a chromosome which is roughly 14, uh, 1,400 nanometers in size. Now what does this mean? This means that the human DNA of a single cell which is 2.17 meters in length is packed into 10 micrometers, so 10 to the minus 6 uh, meters uh, of a nucleus. How, how can we envisage that? And you may have heard about the Great Wall which uh, Donald Trump wants to create between uh, Mexico and the United States. This is supposed to be 3,500 kilometers long. If you take this wall and place it into the White House, which is 51 meters times 26 meters, then you have the equivalent of what is compacted in a nucleosome as terms of DNA. Now, further, we've heard yesterday about the mass mission, uh, but if you take all of your the DNA of your cells, of a single individual body together, you will span uh, two times the diameter of the solar system. So for the DNA of each of your bodies, the Mars mission is a piece of cake. Now, this is due to the compaction which is done with proteins. These proteins uh, contain functional information because they can be modified by certain epigenetic systems uh, and you can have in a certain region genes which are active because they have the epigenome constructed such that they can be active. And uh, what is important is that uh, for a couple of years we are realizing now that also the structure, the 3D architecture of the DNA within the nucleus itself contains topological information. So there are uh, transcription factories, there are silencing machineries and uh, these kind of things within a nuclear body so that the DNA itself has all of the basic information but on top of the DNA there's the epigenome, then there's a structural architecture of the entire chromatin in the nucleus. All of that gives a huge amount of information which is used to uh, control life. Now, as I said, the chromatin in the nucleus is inher inherently asymmetric, but it is not like a, uh, like a spaghetti on a, on a, on a, uh, on a plate, uh, because the spaghetti, you can never reorganize the same type of spaghetti if you take two different uh, plates. In contrast, if you take a nucleus, and this is actually an experiment which is called a high C analysis of a single nucleus. So you are looking at the chromatin structure of a single nucleus. And within the nucleus, for example, what you see here is the territory depicted by this particular chromosome. And you see that this is not spread over the entire nucleus, but it has a certain positioning and moreover there are certain aspects of the organization of this chromatin fiber in the nucleus, this is inter interface chromatin. For example, there may be regions of uh, chromatin which in a linear structure would be several million bases apart, but in the three-dimensional structure they are in proximity. And indeed we can show that they will interact with each other and so a regulatory element, which is a million base pairs away, can actually regulate a structure which is, uh, for example, a gene or regulatory element. And we've, we've heard yesterday also about immunoglobulin genes. There are these super regulatory elements 
there's a chromatin structure which puts elements in, in proximity and uh, for example one of the diseases in cancer puts uh, uh, part of the, uh, it's the IgG enhancer next to the MYC oncogene and this is an, an, a pathological proximity uh, due to, uh, to a chromosomal rearrangement which is then the cause of the disease. So uh, there are elements which are regulatory at distance, there are elements which are silenced because they occupy a certain region and there are uh, machineries which are transcription factories which seem to be uh, associated in a particular spatial organization within the nucleus. So uh, we are just starting to learn what is the information content of this organization of the various chromosomes but there are technologies which are very rapidly developing to decipher them. So from that I would like to come to the conclusion of the first part uh, the essential features in the propagation and in the function of organisms have both symmetric and uh, asymmetric characters. Uh, if we uh, concentrate on the symmetry, uh, it's the conservation, multiplication and the maintenance of information that uses mainly symmetrical processes. And I uh, discussed already what are these processes with you before. These uh, processes are basic principles of life. Life would not exist without these principles and uh, we would not be able to propagate organisms. Now as far as uh, asymmetry is concerned, it's mainly the execution of information and the information itself which is asymmetrically stored in the DNA and I uh, gave you the examples. So all of this uh, what I did not point out is intracellular communication is of course directional and uh, intercellular and intra-organismal communication so this involves for example the action of hormones or uh, the neuronal system which is acting at distance all of these are essential for the evolution of multicellular organisms now the question arises is there a single key determinant of life or of living systems and if so is this symmetric or asymmetric and uh, to the best of my knowledge I found only one answer to that and that is that the most salient feature of life is its linear dynamics life is a temporal evolution it's a vector and it has a direction and it is in inherently asymmetric. So it's from the fertilization of the egg to the death that there is a clear propagation of life and this has been recognized by Heraklit uh, who uh, already a couple of uh, years ago concluded uh, that everything flows. Now after fertilization what is actually happening uh, is that there is cell growth differentiation and that there are extremely complex and auto-regulated systems which are generated and maintained through the DNA encoded information. How is that possible? To illustrate what I mean, once a zygote is formed by an oocyte and a sperm, this is a single cell. This single cell then already contains all of the information to diversify into an embryo which has already body structures, axes, everything well established. This means there is directed cell multiplication, diversification, organogenesis, homeostasis, everything is controlled even to the extent that when something goes wrong those cells are for example are simply eliminated and sometimes elimination helps to shape the body for example you have four fingers because the space in between the cells which have been existing here simply died. So this uh, process at the end leads to an adult body which itself is also extremely dynamic as you can see here on the slide and you can see that these are 37 trillion cells which are really nicely organized and very dynamic because every day there are 40 to 50 billion cells who die and every second five million new cells are generated. 
So this is really a very dynamic body. And actually Christian and Nüsslein Wollert, who got the Nobel Prize for uh, detecting the origin of the body axis in Drosophila, uh, <coughs> she said uh, some years ago that one of the most profound questions in nature is to understand how complexity arises from initial simplicity, from this simplicity, that complexity. And how is that possible? How can such complex and extremely dynamic systems be faithfully regulated? And that is the area of a, a rather recent discipline in biology, and that's what we call systems biology, because uh, what we need is to integrate multiple types of information which are huge. Uh, all of these informations are in giga or terabyte uh, dimensions and uh, they, uh, they concern uh, the various complex interactive networks, networks between elements. Elements can be DNA, protein, RNA, metabolite, hormones, everything. These networks they are controlled by a multiplicity of regulatory systems and everything is done by molecular communication. So it's like in a society where people interact with each other. You have politicians, you have administrators, you have those who really work and uh, this is exactly the same in nature. So we try to understand what are uh, the components and how these components which are depicted here are actually interacting with each other at which time and why in space. Um, and the systems which we are looking at is the entire genome, the epigenome, the chromatin, the transcriptome, the translatome, metabolome, metagenome and every day there are new ohms added to this. Uh, so there is one of the ohms. Here you see a network and there's no need to, to focus on something. You will not read anything. Suffice it to say that every second in each cell there are about 10 million chemical reactions which occur. And these reactions, they are directed by such regulatory networks. These are directional and of course asymmetric and they are essential to maintain uh, the features of the system. Now, in such uh, networks, you can identify certain functional areas which we call hubs. These hubs are, for example, linked to particular functions in a cell. One hub can be simply proliferation, one can be apoptosis, one can be uh, endocrine uh, functions and so forth. And just to give you an example how tightly regulated these hubs are, here is the P53, it's a tumor suppressor system, so a controlling system which uh, will force any cell to go into suicide if something goes wrong. And you see that there are various input levels, so it's like a computer, you have uh, certain uh, information which come into the system. There is a processor which is P53 together with this MDN2 and these two together they decide whether a cell will go for example into senescent or whether it will be forced to uh, to kill itself and this is the output here. Of course the output then is uh, giving information back to the input and to the regulatory module to uh, modulate the system because sometimes you want to give uh, a cell the chance to survive uh, if it is not damaged sufficiently enough to be killed, for example. Now, there I would like to give a, a, a very brief um, glimpse of what we are currently doing in the lab because what this touches is the question of cell fates. So we want to understand in the, in the lab how uh, cell fates are regulated. We take simple systems, we ask for example, a cell can, uh, if it is a stem cell, it can go into the endodermal lineage or it can go into the neuronal lineage towards the brain. And we ask why is that? and which one goes according to which decisions into which direction. We use a simple system which is just stem cells which are pre-committed. So we have two types of stem cells. 
one which, which becomes endodermal, the other becomes uh, neuronal just by adding a morphogen. A morphogen in this case is retinoic acid. So what we uh, do is that we induce these two different cell fates and then what we generate by a multiplicity of various uh, experiments, ChIP-SEC, RNA-SEC and so forth, uh, gene regulatory network. So what you see here is simply in uh, colors in a log scale uh, from green to red genes which are uh, uh, repressed or which are activated and they are just given as dots. What we realize that in both systems there are common uh, genes which are regulated both in the neuronal and the endodermal pathway and we realize also that what you see hardly on top here there is first of all a, a significant number of other transcription factors which are activated. These transcription factors are activated by the fact that the morphogen retinoic acid binds to a receptor. This receptor itself is a transcription factor and induces a series of other transcription factors. These other transcription factors then activate certain sub uh, <coughs> programs in the cell and the final outcome is uh, graphically depicted uh, here because we digitalize the entire information which we have here. So every uh, bubble is a gene which is turned on or turned off or not affected at all. So this is plus one, minus one or zero. And then we can ask questions for example like if we activate, uh, so this may be the retinoic acid receptor, but what happens if we activate this gene here, which is a transcription factor, how much of the readout at the end will be activated? The reason for doing that is that we want to understand which are the master regulators of a biological process. So we can computationally predict what are the master regulators, and that is what you see here. Uh, there are, for example, the GBX2, TAL2, which are predicted to be master regulators for neurogenesis. And in fact, if we go into the entire network, uh, and uh, this is, has been published here uh, in, in two papers in 2011 and uh, last year, uh, we can actually demonstrate and validate that genes like this, and I think I'll have a slide for that, are actually master regulators within this network. What I want to add at this moment, just as a sidetrack, that cell fates does not mean only uh, uh, cell differentiation, but we are looking also on tumorigenesis. So one of my PhD students uh, published a paper last year in which we are looking on the changes which occur within this network upon activating tumorigenesis in a human normal cell. So, uh, these are just the technologies which we use. What I want to, to point out here is, for example, the GBX in TAL2. I said these were bioinformatically identified master regulators. And you see here the time scale. Uh, you see how this GBX itself activates transcription factors along the time scale of the experiment. So it is not always activating transcription factors in the first hour and then later, but it can be that after 48 hours a certain transcription factor is activated. And all of these uh, colored uh, nodes which you see here are transcription factors. And we can actually establish a network of transcription factors which are readouts of the neurogenesis itself. Now, we can use this information actually on the one hand to uh, induce differentiation of cells without having the morphogen added, so that is what you see here. We just activate by using the CRISPR system in a bit different way than it has been displayed yesterday. Here we use a CRISPR system to uh, activate the endogenous gene. So here we are not adding the TAL2 gene to the system, but we activate by a, a, a synthetic activator, which is called VP6, VP64, uh, which is targeted by RNA to this particular promoter of the endogenous TAL2 gene. We activate the TAL2 gene 
And then you can see that uh, the cell differentiates and the axonal structures, which is an uh, indicative element, are, are stained by these two uh, markers of neurogenesis. Now, what I can't uh, show you is that we have used this information actually in order to engineer a cell fate of cells which are not committed to neurogenesis. So we've taken endodermally committed cells, we've activated uh, activate a set of endogenous genes within these committed cells and they become, as what is shown here, neurons or neuronal precursors. Now, this system can not only be used uh, in order to uh, study, for example, neuronal differentiation, but we've uh, analyzed uh, the formation of induced pluripotent cells, the stem cell, uh, induced pluripotent stem cell, IPS cells, and we've, we've uh, analyzed what are the uh, key factors uh, which are activated during this process induced by the uh, OKSM procedure. This is not everything. We have uh, studied transdifferentiation. In all of these cases, we have not done the experiments. They are out there. The data are in databases. We've taken these data, analyzed them, and identified those transcription factors, key factors in the regulatory network, which is responsible for the phenomenon which we are observing. And beyond that, we have a, a project in the lab where we have stored something like uh, three and a half thousand data sets uh, which comprise the RNA-seq, uh, no, this is a, a matrix array, so transcriptome information of about 300 cell types. And we've generated large matrices with which we are able to predict which kind of transcription factors do we need to activate in one particular cell line to generate another cell type. And this is currently uh, um, uh, in preparation and the experiments are ongoing uh, to show that this predictable bioinformatics or in silico predicted um, uh, transdifferentiation is actually possible in a couple of cases we, we have successfully demonstrated that. So we are going beyond that because you may know that uh, you can not only generate cell fates in certain cell structures but you can go beyond and try to generate organs in vitro. So this is in cell culture and these structures are called organoids. So we are uh, inducing these organoids for the brain. We are making what is called mini brains and we are studying how in a, a particular region of this organoid certain genes are activated, certain decisions are taken and we can do that because there are now technologies like spatial transcriptomics so we can take sections of a, or a micrometer of a section of, a, of such a structure, of such an organoid and, and derive the entire transcriptome so by RNA-seq from that. Uh, you may know, you may, have, those who read The Economist, uh, actually uh, 2017 has been uh, declared as the year of the organoid. There are multiple uh, efforts going on to uh, create synthetic organs which can be used for a multiplicity of, of different purposes. We use them to study uh, uh, the gene regulatory networks but you can also introduce, in, in particular by genome engineering using the CRISPR-Cas now, you can generate diseases. This is interesting for neurodegenerative diseases, for example. But you can also think of regenerative medicine in order to replace <coughs> uh, defective parts of organs. Now, this was the first part. To the second part, I'm going back to the original question of this, um, <coughs> of this uh, uh, conference, which is symmetry and asymmetry and body axis. And uh, body axis, we have three body axes which are depicted here, the anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral and left, right. And this is not only in man, it's in fishes as well, except that some more primitive organisms have only one uh, axis. But the question is how can such an asymmetry be generated uh, from an initially 
symmetrically dividing uh, fertilized egg. And the answer to that is, just to give you the take home message, uh, nature has several solutions for that. One of the solutions, uh, which has been uh, very well depicted in Drosophila, and uh, I'll go rapidly through those, is to generate a morphogenic gradient of a transcription factor which is locally deposited <coughs> by the mother into the egg and which then uh, begins, uh, provides spatial information which is then subdivided into more specific information, local regional information to activate uh, transcription factors and the corresponding target genes. Uh, as I said, these uh, initial transcription factors are donated by the mother in Drosophila and they uh, activate the regulatory networks which then are acting in a local, regional, temporal manner. <coughs> but there's another uh, principle which is not chosen by Drosophila but by other higher animals which is generating very early in embryogenesis a directional flow of liquid which is sensed by particular cells and this uh, flow of liquid generates information which activates again transcription factors which sense this activates other transcription factors which are specific for the left right axis and I'll go rapidly to that. So Drosophila and this uh, gave rise to a Nobel Prize to, uh, to uh, Christiane nusslein Wollert. Uh, it is the deposition, the asymmetric deposition of a transcription factor and in the form of RNA of uh, something which is called bicoid. This RNA here is just deposited on the anterior pole of the egg uh, from nurse cells which are only around this part of the egg. So the egg shape is already donated by the mother, formed by the mother. And then this anterior uh, RNA is translated into protein and generates a gradient along this axis. Now, as we know from computational analysis, and this has been long time ago uh, depicted, one single gradient is not sufficient for positional information. You need another one, and this is, for example, nanos. Again, the mother on the other side, on the posterior end, deposits nanos RNA, which is then translated. These two proteins are now generating uh, a gradient, and this gradient gives you anterior, posterior information, which is further interpreted. For the dorsal ventral axis, it's exactly the same. The mother provides uh, the protein dorsal, which is again, as we call it, uh, maternal effect gene. Uh, um, <clears throat> okay, the specifics are not so important. And uh, dorsal is, you see, positioned at the ventral side. So even though it's called dorsal, it's, it's deposited at the ventral side but it is a, a, a transcription factor which represses target genes. So one of the target genes is DPP, which is decapentaplegic. This gene is suppressed here, as you see, we have ventral, whereas it is dorsally expressed. And vice versa, twist is a positive target gene. It's uh, deposited, uh, expressed in the ventral area and not in the dorsal area because it's only the ventral area where these genes are. So again, we are back to transcription factors which activate their cognate genes and uh, this is more complex than I depicted it here because also for, for a just for the ventral axis you need at least 11 uh, genes which are, or 11 factors which are donated by the mother. And uh, this goes into multiple regulatory networks which establish further segmentation. One example how to interpret this information of the dorsal, ventral, uh, of the anterior, posterior axis is here. So there is a gene which is called hunchback, which is activated by bicoid and expressed up to this area. And uh, the, the information is such that certain genes at a certain uh, position within the egg due to the information coming from nanos or from bicoid, they sense this information and they are expressed then because they know the, the, uh, the uh, intensity of the gene, the expression of the gene is a, is a, um, a predictor for activating uh, 
the transcription of the corresponding target genes. So you can easily see that within uh, this uh, anterior-posterior uh, axis you can have genes which interpret this positional information and this can go further and further until you have genes like even skipped or Fushitaratsu which are actually demarcating boundaries and actually those of you who have ever seen a larvae of Drosophila you see these body segments very clearly and these body segments will later on after metamorphosis contribute to certain types of uh, structures in the fly and uh, these genes are interpreting the positional information originally deposited by the mother. Okay, yes. So, uh, I should, uh, um, so uh, just to point out that in mammalian embryogenesis, uh, so like in humans, the situation is a bit different because we don't need as humans maternal information. In fact, it seems to be more that uh, it is the transition from the four to the eight st cell steps where actually uh, you generate uh, breaking of symmetry. The four cells are still symmetric. Eight cells, due to physical laws, have automatically to have an inside and an outside. You cannot arrange eight cells without having one cell inside if you want to maintain lowest surface energies. So it seems to be that simply physical laws are responsible for breaking the symmetry in, in, in humans. And this you can demonstrate by uh, having transcription factors differentially expressed during this uh, early stage. These are uh, uh, two transcription factors, GATA6 and OCT4, which you can see mark different types of cells. And this is in vitro, uh, reproduced, published last year in two papers, and uh, these data show that there's no effect, maternal effect. Now, I uh, still want to address one last axis. Okay. Okay, let me just show you uh, this last axis, the left-right axis, and I just want to show you uh, the step where things occur. This is in the mouse when you have 600 cells, and there is actually a particular area which is called the primitive streak, where there are extensions of a cell, and these rotate. And the rotation of this generates a flux of fluid, and this flux of fluid bends other type of cilia. Cilia are called these, these uh, structures. And this generates a signal uh, which is interpreted by transcription factors. And I just want to show this to you because it's quite appealing. So you see, these are cilia which are rotating and they are all rotating clockwise and they are generating a flux of liquid to one direction and this is then interpreted by transcription factor like this one, lefty and nodal, and you see there's an asymmetric organization of this. I don't need to go into the global view, I just want to show you a nice a symmetric element. I would like to thank you for your presentation and I hope that uh, I have given you some elements of symmetry and asymmetry in uh, living systems and I hope uh, not to see the same face as I see on this corridor. Yeah. Thank you very much.